we're going to cover the six big key factors behind general physical preparedness and we're going to start right now. What's up everybody, it's Dave Miller from GarageStrength.com and if it's your first time to the channel and you're interested in learning more about sports science, you wanna become a better athlete, you wanna run faster and get stronger, make sure that you like, you subscribe, and you ring that notification bell so we can help you become a beast. So one of the biggest questions that I get asked is, Dan, how important is GPP? How important is general physical preparedness? And immediately my first response is like, hold on, let's, let's slow down a little bit. What, let's think about this. What is general physical preparedness? Because from the surface, it sounds like this absurd term. It's extremely complex, like general physical preparedness. But in reality, it's just being physically prepared to be an athlete or to be prepared to actually partake in fitness. And so it's a pretty simple idea, but with a very complex term that makes it a little bit confusing, a little bit harder to understand. And so that's what strength coaches love to do. That's what I love to do. We love to make really intricate, detailed terms that are pretty simple, just to make ourselves sound a little bit smarter. It's being prepared to train. It's being, it's not only just being prepared to train, but it's also having a general physical level so that as you start to work with more specific exercises or as you start to do more specific training towards your athletic venture, if your GPP, if your general physical preparedness is at a certain level, if you get hurt or you miss training sessions because of any, maybe you have a competition and you have, you're gonna miss four or five training days, if your level of GPP is higher, you shouldn't lose any of those gains that you've put into the weight room over the last six to eight weeks. That is a hypothetical situation. In essence, all GPP is, is a way for us as strength coaches to prepare our athletes for their athletic venture or for their fitness goals, whatever those might be. And then in the meantime, it's also something we can utilize to maintain a level of fitness or to maintain a level of sports performance. And that is really what it comes back to is that we've got to start to think about it in regards to the specific movements or the specific athletic ventures that each of our athletes are going to be partaking in. And so some examples, this is where I think GPP has been lost over the years. A lot of this became popular with Mel Siff, uh, Verka Shansky, Michael Yesis, all these different sports scientists and these authors were putting stuff out in the early 2000s and GPP was one of those buzzwords that really, really started to grow quite a bit. But why? A lot of strength coaches early on in the early 2000s started to jump on like, yeah, this is the next big thing. This is going to help us assimilate those calories a lot more. This is going to help us maintain a higher level of muscle protein synthesis. This is going to help keep fitness levels a little bit higher so that they recover faster. And there are a lot of truths to these different aspects, but some of these coaches bastardize the concept of GPP. And so some examples might be, you've heard of strength athletes going out and going out for two mile jogs. So a shot putter, a discus thrower, or a power lifter, and their coach is sitting there going, hey, we're gonna go out and we're gonna run 400s. We're gonna do six 400 meter sprints. We gotta raise that GPP. Or we're gonna do an hour and a half of med ball throws. We gotta raise that level of GPP so that then we can get you in shape to then get you in shape. And that's really what it comes back to is, a lot of the bastardized versions are let's increase GPP, so let's get our athletes in shape, so then we can do specific work to get in shape for the specific sport. And it ends up being this weird dilemma where it's like, hey, we just got in shape to now get in shape. Why not just get in shape for the sport right off the bat? And I think that that's one of the big key factors immediately is that we have to have this basic understanding. And that's gonna lead us into those six key factors behind GPP to help you understand how you can utilize this in your own programming and how it can definitely have an effect, positive and negative, on your own training. So 
So that first key factor to develop a solid foundation of GPP is to understand the sport movement. If I'm looking at GPP and I'm taking an athlete that is a court athlete, let's say a basketball player, and he or she might run anywhere from five to 10 yards at a time or 20 yards at a time at a pretty high intensity rate, and then they might get you know a short break and then they've got to do it again. So that's what they need to do. That's how much they're running on a given basis throughout their actual sport. But if we compare that to someone that was a shot putter, now we take shot putters and all they're really doing is moving inside of a seven foot circle. They might take 20 to 30 throws in a training session and it's only inside of a seven foot circle and it might only last two to two and a half seconds. So that movement is going to be drastically different. Then we compare that to someone who's an offensive or defensive lineman in American football. And now we see, well, these guys are gonna move quite a bit more relative to the shot putter. They also might end up moving at a higher intensity than that shot putter might during practice. And so it's important right off the bat to understand that sport movement. So one of the next key factors behind GPP is to comprehend what's the resistance of the object or the opponent. So if we're talking about freestyle wrestlers, when a freestyle wrestler gets done their competitive season, let's say they take off for two to three weeks where they do nothing, to get them back into form, it might take us 12 weeks to build them back up to where they had been previously, when they were in season shape, right? So the first two to three weeks of that freestyle wrestler could in theory be laying down that foundation of GPP. But one of those key factors is, you know, know the sport movement. So we know the interval-based training around freestyle wrestling. We know that there's a lot of 10 to 20 second goes, and then there might be a period where there's a lull of another 15 to 25 seconds where there's no action in the actual competitive sport. What's the resistance of their opponent? So a freestyle wrestler, especially someone like Nick Gwazdowski, who's a heavyweight, we know that his opponent could weigh 120 kilos. So the resistance of his opponent is significantly greater than say, you know, going and back and using our shot putter example, where this shot putter is dealing with an object that only weighs 16 pounds. A discus thrower is dealing with an object that only weighs two kilos, so 4.4 pounds. So that general preparation, that general physical preparedness that we need to achieve in the first two to three weeks might be a little bit different because we have to factor in the opponent. But what does that mean? Does that mean that the, during those three weeks, leading in developing that GPP, that the wrestler should be lifting, you know, 120 kilos repetitively in any way, shape or form, maybe to a point, yes. But it also means that, hey, when we do the specific work, when we're in that three week developmental phase, all the wrestler can do during that period is, hey, let's get on the mat. Let's try and work with an opponent and let's do it at a very low intensity. Let's do it for an hour at 40 to 50% intensity compared to normal. Nice, easy shots, get heavy on the head, set up your shots, and you're just doing some real repetitive, even shadow drills, but repetitive work on the mat. One of the things that I did when I was training with Dr. Anatoly Bunderchuk is that one of the best ways to get in shape regarding our object was take a throw, when you walk out, pick up your shot and then throw the shot back. So now we're gonna do that at a lower intensity and we're understanding the resistance of the object. We're developing, we're getting in shape based off of that resistance. We're getting more reps in than we typically would so we can get in shape and adapt a lot faster, but it's not gonna be at a very high intensity when we're trying to develop that GPP. But a lot of coaches tend to make that a little bit more complex. They'll say, let's throw med balls again for 30 to 45 minutes. And it might not carry over to the shot because it's not the exact same joint pattern. It's not the same movement. And it might not carry over to the wrestling mat either because it's not a heavyweight wrestler. It's just a little light medicine ball. So it can increase our general physical preparedness, but it's not going to increase it relative and specific to that exact sport. So it's important to understand the resistance of the object that you're utilizing or the opponents that you're gonna be handling during that competition.
the next two factors are going to sort of go hand in hand here where we got repetitions and rest and then intensity. And so if we can think about our examples of that freestyle wrestler, right? What are the repetitions that they're going to be needing? They're going to be in a six minute match if they're a freestyle wrestler, if they're wrestling the international style. That's going to be a six minute match. On top of that, what's the rest period going to be like? They get a minute in between periods. Okay, first period, second period, you get one minute. Even inside of that match, there's going to be points where the intensity of the match might drop a little bit. It's gonna be similar to interval-based training. Now, that brings us to the intensity. The intensity of a wrestling match is going to be pretty high. If we compare this to a football player, let's say a defensive lineman or an offensive lineman, they're only playing one way. These football players might have 40, 50, 60 plays in a game, depending upon what style of game we're dealing with, what their offense might be that they're running, the repetitions are going to be 40, 50, 60 reps. Their rest period might be short when they're on the field, but it might be a very long period of rest when they're off the field. The intensity is going to be pretty high. Now, when we compare those two to our shot putter example, that shot putter might take a throw and then they walk out to the sector, they pick up their shot, they walk back in. So the rest period is gonna be two to three minutes long and the intensity might only be at 60, 70, 75%. So that intensity level is going to be a little bit different. Now, what can we do then? As we know that, we can sit there and take a step back and say, hey, the intensity or, or the, the volume needed to really increase and achieve a nice level of GPP for a shot putter is going to be significantly lower. If we use our example from Dr. B, it might be very easily for a shot putter to achieve that proper level of GPP within two weeks just by taking a throw with a shot and then throwing that shot back to the circle and just doubling their actual repetitions. They're going to adapt pretty quickly. For a wrestler, for a football player, they have a lot of very specific work that they're going to be doing on the field or on the mat. And that's the most important stuff. So in the weight room, we can get a decent amount of repetitions and let's say we're working in the rep ranges of of 7 to 12 to 15 reps but we don't want to kill these guys so we're going to let them have a minute and a half to two minutes rest because they might be a little bit bigger if we're talking about football players so the intensity in the weight room might not be as high and it doesn't need to be really all we're focusing on during this gpp period is just trying to strengthen the joints trying to create hypertrophy trying to improve their overall feeling it doesn't need to be super super complicated it's really just get into the weight room spend two to three weeks move properly squat hit full depth get full range of motion through all joints and start to feel better. And while you're on the practice field, you can keep that intensity a little bit lower because that's your specific work that you need to focus on. It's important that two to three to four week introduction period for those types of sports like football, like wrestling, that specific work, the intensity has to be just a little bit lower to stimulate a little bit more adaptation. And then within five or six weeks, those wrestlers, those football players, they're gonna to start to feel really, really good. That next key factor for GPP programming is focusing on just establishing general benchmarks. If I'm working with a world-class wrestler, a world-class football player, a world-class Olympic weightlifter, you know, a world-class basketball player, they're gonna be able to get in shape really quickly. It's not going to be a really long time to get them into shape. And so what I like to do is even just establish a benchmark. Hey, let's take our key lifts. Let's take a power snatch, a, a clean, a back squat, a bench press, pull-ups. Let's establish these benchmarks. If I can get freestyle heavyweight wrestler to, you know, to power snatch 80 kilos, to, to power clean 130 kilos, to back squat, you know, 150, 160 kilos for five reps, to bench press 150 kilos for five to six reps, and do, you know, six to 10 dead hang pull-ups, we're working with world-class athletes, right? These guys can adapt very, very quickly. So one of those key factors is now you have those benchmarks established. When Gwiz hits this number in these different lifts, he's pretty much established that GPP that we need and now I can sort of give them that green light. Hey, we can push in the weight room and we can start to push quite a bit more on the mat. And that's one of those key factors is even with Olympic weightlifters, what I like to do 
with Olympic weightlifters in GPP is say, let's do 12 singles, let's do 15 singles, but on 45 seconds rest. And if I can take an example of Haley Reichert, if I can get her to hit 12 singles in the snatch at 80 to 90% of her max, all within that 80 to 90 percent range with just 45 seconds rest, and she can do that consistently, now she's hitting anywhere between 65 kilos and 75 kilos for her snatch during that 12 by one period with very short rest, her GPP levels are gonna be pretty freaking significant. But again, it's important to understand those benchmark lifts because that helps us understand how quickly an individual adapts to the stimuli. If we're gonna dive deep into GPP, we want those benchmarks to be specific to their sport. It can't be just random stuff that we're throwing against the wall. It has to be exercises that we know that that actual athlete needs to be very good at their sport. And that's one of those big key factors in GPP is that we have a lot of strength coaches that will just use very, very generic benchmark movements. And now all of a sudden, they're having the exact same benchmark movements for their swimmers as they would for their wrestlers. And they're not the same sport. So we have to be prepared specific to the actual tasks of the sport. And that's where establishing those benchmarks for each individual athlete in their sport becomes a key factor behind developing the proper amount of GPP. So finally, when we get down to it, the whole key factor is understanding the sport, understanding your athlete, and taking a bigger picture dive into your programming. And so what I do with our athletes is when they take that break, we expose them to training. And that's why it is called the exposure phase. But what we end up doing is with this specific athlete, shot putter, wrestler, swimmer, football player, how much technical coordination is needed in their sport? How much stamina is needed in their sport? And what kind of stamina? Are they doing aerobic-based training similar to swimming and, and even to a point freestyle wrestling? Or do they need a different type of stamina like a shot putter would? And then we can start to think about mobility. So we need to have some passive flexibility. We need to have stability in these different joint ranges. So what kind of mobility is necessary and needed during their sport and for that specific individual. If we're dealing with wrestlers, they're gonna be a little bit more internally rotated. They might favor one leg over the other. Same with Olympic weightlifters. So we've gotta figure out, hey, what kind of mobility stuff can we work on to make them a little bit more stable in these different positions? And then how much hypertrophy does that individual need? Do they need to have a little bit larger muscle size, muscle mass? to increase their power output later on to help with recovery. And all these things start to factor in. But one area where I think a lot of strength coaches fail miserably is understanding what's that big goal during the exposure phase. And the exposure phase is when we institute GPP-based training. And that's gonna be, let's work a little bit on aerobic capacity. And that could be, again, as simple as the example I used earlier, where it's twice a week we have a power-based athlete burn 60 to 80 calories over a 20 minute time frame, and it's really, really easy. It's easy for them to do. They can have a conversation and it's not gonna beat them up, but instead it's actually gonna help them with recovery. But this is not going to be interval style training. It's going to be longer duration periods that are simple. Okay, it's very simple. And you'll see the recovery start to improve. But one of those key factors too becomes Again, we want caloric assimilation. So how well can that athlete recover from all these different aspects based off of their nutrition? And so that's the main goal, but then we don't focus on, hey, can we make sure we're getting microbiota accessible carbohydrates? Can we make sure that our athlete is eating resistant starch so that their gut health can improve so that they can assimilate their nutrients much more effectively when they're trying to recover. And that's a big key aspect that I've learned 
behind GPP. It's not just head in, go to Wendy's and eat whatever you want because now we're doing all this work in the weight room. We're trying to get you back in shape and we're doing specific work for your sport movement but then we just waste it by going eating Wendy's. We've got to recognize that eating properly can have a dramatic impact on GPP. And so one of my big takeaways is that a lot of strength coaches will spend and waste time doing GPP as though they've got to do tons of sled drags, they've got to do tons of mobility work, and they're just doing random exercises that really have no bearing on their sport. What we even do is, again, we have wrestlers, we have football players, we have Olympic weightlifters that just dive right into their typical sport training, but the intensity is gonna be cut down, the repetition might be a little bit lower, we might be doing that more steady state cardio, but it's still going to be specific work. It's going to be specific to the tests that they're ultimately training for. It's just the intensity is a little bit lower, and then during that exposure phase, we have to see how long it takes to hit those benchmark lifts so that we can understand what their specific level of GPP is. And then we can start to rise the intensity. We can increase their repetitions in the weight room. And then we'll see that when we do that, it doesn't have as much of a negative impact on their actual sport practice because that's the absolute priority here. So understanding that GPP is not this overly complicated thing. It's just bringing in your traditional training with slightly more volume at a much lower intensity. And over time, you can understand how your athletes react and ultimately see their adaptations on a consistent basis. And that's gonna help you become a better coach. So if you want more information about this concept and about training in general, head over to garagestrength.com. You can pick up our parabolic periodization book and course. If you want more information about sports science-based training, click on this card right here. Until next time, guys, peace.